Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chatham House, uh, which incidentally was founded 100 years ago this week. Um, so happy birthday to us. Uh, my name is Tim Benton. I'm Research Director in Emerging Risks at Chatham House and Director of the Energy, Environment and Resources Programme. A further welcome to you all to this panel discussion on the business case for investing in nutrition with a particular focus on low and middle income countries. As I think everybody will know across the world, over 800 million people are chronically undernourished and nearly 3 billion are facing other forms of mal malnutrition associated with either too few nutrients or the issues associated with obesity. Despite huge gains in the last half century in reducing hunger, globally, few people are eating healthily. As is typical, the poorest people in all countries, but perhaps most especially in low and middle income countries, they are the ones that are most affected. We have had decades of progress in growing productivity in agriculture and extending markets to some of the remotest parts of the world, but today's food systems are still not able to feed ev everyone, let alone provide healthy, nutritious diets. The outcome from our struggling food system is a pandemic of diet-related diseases, a break on economic development, and hundreds of millions of people, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, facing lifetimes of ill health and poverty. Against this background, malnutrition is often seen as a public health problem to be tackled by governments, donors, and the development community. However, we are here today to discuss the need and scope for business to see this as partly their problem and to examine the financial and reputational risks of them not doing so. To support this discussion, we are today launching a report called The Business Case for Investment in Nutrition, downloadable from the Chatham House web website and with a link on the slide um, in front of you. We must thank the Power of Nutrition for funding this research and the support from the Research Funders Network acknowledged also on the slide in front of you. So today we have a fantastic panel for the discussion. Uh, firstly, we will have a brief presentation um, from two of the uh, uh, authors of the report about its main findings. And that, those people are Laura Wellesley, Senior Research Fellow at Chatham House, and Caroline Vexler, Economist at Vivid Economics. We will then move on to a panel discussion, uh, a, a, a panel presentation from three very distinguished people. Ken Antwi is currently the head, National Head of HR with Olam Ghana. He is a human resources professional with over 20 years of HR experience and multicultural expo exposure from fast moving consumer goods and financial service industries. His role at Olam has responsibility for five other countries in the West African subregion Mali, Burkina Faso, Benin, Togo, and Niger. And he also sits as a lead on the Ghana Forum of Society for Human Resources Management. Our next speaker will be Dr. Scott Levy who is the regional medical manager with, uh, with Chevron. He is certified in both internal medicine as well as occupational and environmental medicine and has served a variety of positions inside Chevron since joining them in 2012 <clears throat> and is currently responsible for all health and medical related operations in Europe, Eurasia, Middle East and Africa. He has served in a variety of further leadership roles in the medical community and also on many boards and executive committees. Our third speaker is Professor uh, Jess Fanzo, who is Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Food Policy and Ethics at Johns Hopkins University. She also serves as the Director of the Global Food Ethics and Policy Programme at Hopkins and sits on an absolutely mind-bogglingly huge range of committees, um, including being co-chair, former co-chair for the Global Nutrition Report, team leader for the high-level panel of experts for food systems and nutrition for the UN Committee on Food Security, and Lancet Commission on Healthy Diets for Sustainable Food Systems. So I hope you'll agree with me, a truly wonderful panel um, to give us their reflections on the topic and the report. Um, following the panel discussion, we'll move on to a wider Q&A. And uh, before we get to the kind of meat of, the, of this uh, presentation, a little bit of ha housekeeping. So first bit of housekeeping, today's discussions are on the record. They are not under the Chatham House rule. The uh, presentations and discussion is being recorded and may be shared afterwards. Um, 
because this is a Zoom seminar, it's difficult to interact properly with audiences. But if you have questions, and we encourage people to have questions, ask questions, please type them into the Q&A box, um, uh, which is uh, on the menu at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, and feel free, if you see a question in there that uh, is similar to the one that you were going to ask, to like uh, other people's questions. Behind the scenes, we've got a team who will look at the questions, group them together, and uh, pass them back to me to ask the panelists, um, uh, depending on uh, uh, the, the, the interest that um, uh, members of the audience feel. So given that we're asking questions through Q&A, there is no need to wait until uh, the Q&A opens to uh, add your questions as we go through, even including points of clarification uh, on the reports findings from Laura and Caroline, please feel free to type them in as we go along. So without further ado, because we've got very rich discussions ahead of us, I will now pass on to Laura to start the presentation of the report findings. Over to you, Laura. Thanks, Tim. So as Tim said, what we're focused on in this research and in this webinar today is the relevance of malnutrition to businesses. Malnutrition creates both cost and long-term risks for business. Both undernutrition, which leads to conditions like stunting, underweight and anemia, and the overconsumption of calories leading to overweight and obesity, act as a break on development and growth, both at an individual and at a societal level. When experienced in childhood, malnutrition has lifelong impacts on cognitive and physical development, and it's an intergenerational problem which sees both households and communities trapped in a cycle of poverty and malnutrition. The costs of malnutrition to governments and at societal level have been well explored, but much less focus has been given to the impacts on the private sector. Malnutrition creates costs for businesses by lowering the productivity of the workforce and contributing to health-related absences. And it creates long-term risks for the business environment, limiting human capital development, lowering the resilience of the workforce and wider society to disease and other crises, and suppressing market growth by lessening earning potential and discretionary household spending. Our research focused on these costs and risks to business and look to explore the extent to which they're recognized and mitigated by multinational companies operating in low and middle income settings. Just a quick note on scope of the report. When we talk about malnutrition, we're talking about both undernutrition and overweight and obesity. By undernutrition, we mean childhood stunting and wasting, micronutrient deficiencies in childhood and adulthood, and underweight in adulthood. The vivid economics model that Caroline's about to uh, present addresses un adult underweight and adult obesity primarily, but an extension of that model explores the additional costs of adult anemia and adult short stature, the latter being used as a crude proxy for the experience of stunting in childhood. So I'm going to hand over to Caroline now for the model results. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of the objectives of the modeling work that Vivid supported on and, and some of the key findings from the report, which you can find in more detail in the report, which is, which is now on the website, I believe. Um, so for this report, we developed a bottom-up economic model, which combines household survey data, country and sector level economic data, and emerging academic literature um, with the overall aim of answering the question, what would happen to business output in the short term if um, adult workers achieve the physical state associated with good nutritional outcomes? Um, and we did this for 19 countries in our sample and the modeling results in the bottom up economic analysis show that chronic undernutrition and obesity combined cost businesses in these 19 countries 13 to 65 billion each year which when scaled up to all developing countries equates to 130 to 850 billion. And uh, it's worth noting that this is likely to be a conservative estimate as it doesn't include any forms of micronutrient deficiencies or any of the long lasting impacts of undernutrition in childhood on development outcomes. The table in this slide shows the percentage of sector loss um, as a result of combined undernutrition and obesity. And as you can see on the two left hand side columns, the uh, agricultural and mining sectors. These are where um, the, the costs tend to be highest, most concentrated costs, um, where the prevalence of malnutrition can be the highest, and the sectors are also highly dependent on labor productivity. 
Could you move to the next slide, please? The analysis also shows that the trends in the nutrition uh, transition observed in countries at a national level is also prevalent in the workforce. Um, so this slide, the table in this slide shows um, the relative costs of underweight compared to the cost of obesity. Um, so the, the darker the ochre, the higher the relative cost of underweight compared to obesity, and the darker the, the, the teal, um, the higher the cost of obesity relative to underweight in that sector, in that country. Across the sample, we find that lower income countries typically experience greater costs due to chronic um, underweight uh, uh, prevalence, while more advanced developing countries uh, like Albania uh, and Egypt typically faced uh, a higher, higher cost from obesities. But that the, there are some country, countries in the sample um, that are more middle income within the set of developing countries, which can end up experiencing a double burden of malnutrition from both chronic hunger and obesity, particularly in countries where uh, inequality may be high. So for example, um, Namibia experiences um, a high burden of obesity and chronic hunger. More than 10% of the Namibian workforce is underweight or severely underweight. And at the same time, more than 12% is obese. And as a result, the Namibian economy is affected both in um, sectors which experience high rates of um, underweight as well as high rates of obesity. We also did a first of its kind analysis on the prevalence of uh, anemia by economic sector and the costs of anemia. And uh, there is pretty scarce data nationally and globally on the prevalence of anemia among males. And so we were only able to model this for the five countries for which, for five countries for which we had data. And for these five countries, we found that female workers are 1.4 to 2.6 times as likely as male workers to be anemic, even within the same occupational categories. And this is particularly uh, noteworthy since anemia rates among women are high even in developed countries and the prevalence of anemia among women globally has been increasing since 2010. However, it's also really important to note that we still found a very high prevalence of anemia among males uh, in the workforce, ranging from 8 to 16 percent of the workforce, and this is still imposing quite significant costs um, to businesses as well. Uh, and for some of the countries that we modeled, anemia was the costs of anemia were actually higher than the costs of either underweight or obesity. I'm going to hand back to Laura now. Thank you. So, thinking more broadly than the workforce itself. Good nutrition contributes to a more stable, more resilient, more inclusive, and more productive society. Good nutrition is key to achieving many of the sustainable development goals. It can help lift households out of poverty, it contributes to improved health, it enables children to go to school and achieve their potential, and it enables adults to enter into skilled and well-paid employment. Widespread malnutrition, on the other hand, reduces the resilience of populations to disease, outbreaks, and other crises, and increases the risk of social unrest and armed conflict, contributing to a destabilized business environment. Companies will face growing scrutiny over their impact on nutrition, both among the workforce and the wider community. Investors are waking up to the importance of nutrition and well-being, and to the role that businesses should play in delivering a positive social impact. Our interviews with representatives from 16 large multinational companies indicated a concern that failing to demonstrate a commitment to the health and well-being of their workforce and of the communities in which they operate risks undermining their social license to operate and also risking the credibility of their wider commitment to the sustainable development agenda. Next slide, thank you. 80% of the multinational companies that we sampled for our research are nevertheless taking some form of action in support of improved nutrition. We sampled 180 companies of which 150 report on one or more activities that can contribute to improved nutrition, whether in the workplace or in the community. Particularly common were mentions of partnerships with other stakeholders, nutrition education for employees, and guidance on healthy eating as part of workplace wellbeing programs. The problem is that this activity is largely piecemeal and ad hoc, and there's huge variation both between and within companies in terms of the scale of activity that's being reported on. Overall, reporting on nutrition related activity is very low, but the picture that emerges is a level of corporate action that's just not commensurate with either the prevalence or the, or the financial costs of malnutrition. 
Both prevalence and costs of malnutrition appear to be routinely underestimated. <clears throat> our, interview, our interviews offered some indication of why this might be the case. For one thing, anti-nutrition is thought to be a challenge among the wider population in low and middle income countries, but not one that really touches on the day-to-day -day operations of the company. Many companies we approached declined to take part in an interview because they just didn't see malnutrition as relevant to them. Others we interviewed said that undernutrition wouldn't be an issue for their workforce because they're highly skilled and well paid. Obesity was better recognised as an issue among the workforce, but was seen more as a matter for individual action than for company level concern. A lack of data is another barrier. A number of our interviewees said that they just didn't have good visibility over the nutritional health of their employees and that data on malnutrition among the wider community was patchy and unreliable. The broad sense that came out of our research is that companies really see malnutrition as someone else's problem. Companies are nevertheless in a strong position to take action. Many businesses have the reach, the expertise and the resources to be a significant asset in global efforts to overcome malnutrition. Action can take many different forms, from workplace policies through community engagement programmes to market interventions such as product development and investment in agricultural productivity. Next slide, please, Charlotte. Now is the time for businesses to ramp up engagement and investment in nutrition. Our report outlines three key areas for action. Firstly, to improve nutritional outcomes among the workforce through things like mandatory nutrition training for employees, healthy and ideally subsidised workplace canteens, and policies that support breastfeeding mothers returning to work. They should partner on initiatives at scale to improve outcomes at the community and population level, be that working with local implementing partners to integrate nutrition elements into CSR programmes, or pooling resources and expertise with governments, development agencies or other businesses to deliver large-scale programmes like food fortification. And they should ensure transparency and good corporate governance in all nutrition-related activity reporting openly on all nutrition related activities, both internally and externally, sharing relevant data and information with the SG data providers, and in the case of food and beverage companies, ensuring that their products are healthy, affordable, and supportive of good nutrition. And there's a real need now for this injection of engagement and finance from the private sector. As the global nutrition most countries are off course to meet the SDG2 nutrition targets by 2025. COVID-19 is worsening the existing malnutrition burden in developing countries around the world. And the global recession we're likely to see risks leading to a rollback on progress made over the past decades in lowering the global incidence of malnutrition. The next year or two are a critical moment for intensifying global efforts to tackle malnutrition and for ramping up the level of investment in this space. In particular, the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit, scheduled for December this year but postponed till next year, offers a milestone moment for corporate commitments in support of SDG2. We still need more research to identify the most cost-effective interventions for business, but work already out there from the likes of GAIN and the Scaling Up Nutrition Business Network show us examples of areas that are likely to be fruitful and in which businesses can look to act now. Next slide, please. Thank you. The bottom line of our research really is that malnutrition creates significant costs and risks for businesses, and these are likely to increase unless global efforts to overcome malnutrition are successful. Businesses seem to be routinely underestimating or overlooking the scale of the challenge, but they are well placed to take action. The next 18 months offers a moment of opportunity to ramp up engagement in the nutrition agenda and reduce the burden of malnutrition, both on business and on wider society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Caroline, for that uh, overview of the report. I would refer everybody in the audience, of which there are now over 150, to download and look at the report because it's uh, very rich in its um, analysis and uh, the data presented. So uh, we will now move on uh, to the panel discussion where we're asking each of our three panelists to speak for seven, or seven minutes or so on their reflections on both the area and the report itself. So we're going to start off uh, with Ken from OLAM um, and then move on to Scott and then Jess. So over to you, Ken. 
Thank you very much, Tim. Um, and thank you very much for this opportunity. So um, within, within the last decade or so, um, Olam has been very focused on health of farmers within our supply networks. Um, this also includes that of our workforce, especially you know, in emerging economies. Um, poor health has been a clear, uh, poor health has had a clear impact on individual well-being. And so there has been a broader focus on the livelihoods of our farmers, our employees, and their families. And so this, this is one of the key things that has been in focus. Um, for us in, in Ola, um, the evidence is quite clear with studies from um, you know, the last couple of years. Um, the understanding of, of you know, the relationships between productivity and health um, has for a long time been part of the Olam DNA. And so since 2011, we have embarked on some initiative that we call the Olam Healthy Living Campaign, which seeks to address the health concerns of employees and farmers within the supply chain. Um, so within Africa, um, I think that we have had a number of countries that have been going on with this Olam Healthy Living Campaign. And in 2020 alone, the program is going to be operational in 34 of our businesses in 21 countries across Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Um, some of the key things that are done will be to create awareness, um, you know, on HIV testing, and then, um, you know, prevention of diseases, talk about malaria, STDs. Uh, the other bit is also to invest in, you know, water, sanitation, and then um, infrastructure. So all these are done to improve on the well-being of the employee and the farmers within our supply chain. And so it's against this backdrop that um, we see nutrition to be quite critical in, in our patients. And the fact that um, when you think about the determinants of health, the role of nutrition is clear. And um, we are happy about this and we'll be looking forward to improving the livelihoods of our farmers and employees as well. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, uh, very, very uh, uh, good comments there. Um, we'll now move straight on to Scott from Chevron. Scott, over to sure. you. Sure, sure. Thank you, and it, it is a pleasure and an honour to be here. So, thank you for the invitation. Um, so, so I'll, I'll say a few things. And and a, I mean, I think that the, the report is excellent. I think that the work behind it is is sort of spot on. The, um, you know, one of the things that we'll talk a little bit about Chevron in general and, 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 and some of our issues and, and, how, and how we see things. And um, again, just as the report mentioned, we do, uh, we, we have a lot of, we have a very strong health and wellness sort of portfolio. And when I say health and wellness, I mean internal company uh, resources. And so education, training, support, we supply food, all of that thing, well, you know, and we do that globally. Um, but we also have a strong um, social responsibility um, program as well, and, and as we look more of the external, outside of outside of our doors. Um, but but we look at, at um, you know the the priority in a lot of cases ends up to be sort of the communities where we work. We 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 go to we have a business number one that we put it into location A, um, and we want to make sure that that not only our people are, are are healthy and safe and productive, but also that the community is functional. That we have a we have a pipeline of workers. We have um, you know we have uh, you know, again the um, the have. Uh, adequate nutrition is connected with so many different things, as, as already mentioned in your report, but food security is something that we're very concerned with. You know, a lot of our, um, you know, right now in the, in the in our company is headquartered in the U.S., but we are very global. Um, but even in the U.S., because of the, the COVID pandemic, we're, we're seeing changes of, of, you know, what you think of a rich country, of, you know, and, and a rich country, to, you know, means that we used to have 25 percent of people who, who, who weren't sort of who didn't have the sort of food security. Uh, and now the numbers are probably up to about 40 percent of the U.S. are. Are, are sort of have that have that challenge of of not having that, that that food security and so so that's a country like the U.S. and obviously the COVID's a major issue but we have problems all over the world that are that are, are much more devastating for 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 workers uh, for for the communities um, you know we've got a large business in, in Venezuela and and I can tell you that that when we hear 
um, and listen to the problems they're having. Um, COVID is not not in the top five at, at the moment, and, and so that just tells you that that, that um, globally there are challenges for for all of us. And and the question for us ends up to be, um, you know, again, where we there's a certain amount of money that can that can be distributed, and and how is it that we decide on um, on on what what our priorities are and. And and I think that the, 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 there are a lot of things that prompt us and and and, and make it, and give us some direction on 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 where that that social responsibility budget goes. Um, and and that's on data. You know, I think that the, the key around nutrition has been about um, about what's the return on investment. You know, so so if we put some if we put if we if we do if we start up a program. Um, what is it? What's the what's what's the impact? How many people is it going to help? What, how how what's the impact on GDP? I mean, how how do we how do we determine what the increase in productivity and even our own people are? And I, and I think that that's it, it's um it's very clear to me and and other and and and, and globally that 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 um better nutrition leads to better outcomes. It's it's very you know it's I don't, I don't have to know or return on investment on. on on smoking cessation necessarily to know that, 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 you know, you stop one person from smoking and the impact is significant. And so, so it's the same thing with here with, with, uh, with nutrition. So the question ends up to be, um, again, what's the data? Um, you know, uh, we, we like to, we, what we like to know is sort of the, 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 the short, medium and long term, um, uh, goals and milestones. And, uh, we have, we have given, we, we, uh, we tend to, uh, again, we've given money to lots of different to lots of different groups and organizations, um, but we've had issues in the past where um, maybe we start something, we have project managers, and we uh, and we and we run a program. And what we want to do is we want to transition it to the to the community, um, and we want it to be sustainable. Um, and what happens is we find that, and in, in, in more often than not. Uh, it's only sustainable while we're managing it. And then as soon as we hand it off to, to you know, maybe a government or someone that where it's not necessarily one of their focus items, it ends up getting cut. And so, so, so we, we have history of, of doing things like that. So we, we prefer things that are, that are sustainable, that, that, that run on their own, um, you know, and, and, and continue. So, so, so those are just a, a, a few pieces of, of, of what we're looking for. But, but I think it's, um, you know, and it's also the, the trade-off of, of um, what's an emergency. So we see emergencies happen all the time. So emergencies for us tend to be, again, maybe, uh, again, could be uh, hurricanes or earthquakes, natural disasters or pandemics where, where people are just short of food and they need some kind of uh, food banks need to be refilled, uh, first responders for, for COVID or, um, or hospital workers or, or just the community in general needs to be restocked or we need to manage the logistics. So that gets the, that's usually the, the headline is, is those emergencies. But and, and I don't want to even suggest for a second that 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 the the, the, the level of, of of malnutrition and starvation around the world isn't isn't an emergency. Um, but I but I think that those headline things tend to take over sometimes because it's easier to see the benefit, easier to see the uh, outcome, and what what we've done. And um, I, I know I only have seven minutes, and I could probably talk for seven hours, so I'll, I'll stop there. So thanks very much, Scott. Um... Yeah, no, I was struck by you, your your uh, um, focus on the need for data because I think it's one of the major messages that comes out from the report that lots and lots of companies are doing things, but until we have a really good toolbox of knowing what works and at what scale, it's difficult mm -hmm. to replicate them and therefore cr create some degree of focus on on how things uh, push ahead. So I dare say we'll come back to touch on this in the in the discussion. Sure. And um, for the for the audience, uh, Scott wins the prize because uh, it's about half past three where he is in the world at the moment. So thank you very much for getting up so early to, to talk to us. Um, Jess, now over to you as our final panelist. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for having me. And I really enjoyed reading the report. I'm just going to uh, mention three things of the report that stood out to me and then and then and two other overarching thoughts of, of sort of conundrums I think that we face. On the report, to me, the statistics that eight to 38 billion per year from reduced worker productivity are lost for undernutrition 
and four to 27 billion per year for obesity is a case right there for business to act. And to me, those numbers are staggering. Um, that was just one kind of overarching observation. The second one, um, and this was mentioned during the presentation and, and Tim also had mentioned to us, and you, and you can read it in the report that the costs are probably much higher. Um, not everything was modeled in this economic modeling, particularly uh, child stunting and the impacts on uh, uh, cognitive development, educational attainment. So you can imagine how much more costly this would be if there was a full accounting in place. So I think this report uh, shows it, it is already costly, but imagine if, if they had been able to model everything, it would have been um, uh, incredibly costly. So, and, and maybe during the discussion, we could talk a little bit about, about the challenges of doing that kind of modeling. But, um, and then the figure that is up on the screen, figure eight, I found uh, really interesting in that this was looking at the double burden of adult under, underweight and adult obesity in the workforce. And many countries are struggling with these double burden issues across the workforce. The white that you see, the color white, means that across all those different sectors, both underweight and obesity are equally costly. So and there's a lot of white <laughs> on that figure. And you see in places where like India, Ethiopia, Pakistan, undernutrition is much more costly to the agriculture and mining sector, for example, than overweight. Whereas in places like Egypt and Albania, overweight's more costly in those sectors compared to undernutrition. But there's a lot of white there. So many businesses, many countries are dealing with this very complex double burden of malnutrition or triple burden, quadruple burdens of malnutrition, which makes it very complex on how to act and where to act and what sectors uh, uh, should be acting and how they should do so. And, you know, my two other points is that when you look at this, this, this does present a case for business, but of course we also need government. Um, because this is such a complex situation, we need government to act, we need businesses to act, we need civil society to act, often um, acting together. Because uh, it's not only costly economically, it's costly from a societal development perspective. But often working in partnership doesn't work so well. In a recent paper, a colleague of mine, Jeremy Schiffman and Yusra Shawar at Hopkins, who work on global health, uh, policy processes. We worked on a paper analyzing why do public-private partnerships, why are they so challenging in nutrition and what impedes their success? This was a project that GAIN funded and we found just quickly five things. One is that there's a lack of understanding of the causal pathways behind double burdens, much like what Scott was talking about. If you don't understand the causal pathway, you don't understand the evidence, it's very hard to know where to act and how to partner. Take the double burden, where do you act? Which should you tackle first? Should you do both at the same time? The second thing we found is there's a weak architecture for the global governance for nutrition. In the report, they, uh, there's a call for full transparency and good governance around corporate action on nutrition that's still largely lacking. And I'll come back to that in my last point with COVID. The third is there's lots of power imbalance between public and private actors. There's still um, a lot of uh, uh, mistrust uh, issues around uh, past transgressions, um, uh, present transgressions. And sometimes it's just, some feel it's easier to go alone than to partner. Um, another area is just uh, the lack of evidence on the impact of PPPs by third parties, those outside of the PPPs. And so then it makes it again very difficult to understand what is a successful PPP. We really scoured the literature trying to understand where successful PPPs were um, by those uh, working in third parties. So 
while this is a case for business to invest, they need strong partnerships, they need an enabling environment to work within. And if they don't have that because of these different challenges, this makes it really hard. So to me, the report shows that malnutrition is costly and the long-term costs are, 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 are risky, but we're dealing with this very complex situation now of double burdens that require multiple partnerships. And then just my last point, Tim, and then I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, I think that the double burden of malnutrition is really showing its horns with the COVID pandemic, or maybe it's the COVID pandemic is showing its horns with double burden. I don't, either way, <laughs> there's horns involved and it's not good. Um, you know, I think we know that both undernutrition and overweight uh, present uh, significant comorbidities uh, with those who test positive for COVID. And to me, all of the recommendations in the report will not really stand on two legs if we have this very fractured, sclerotic, global political and uh, enabling environment. And this goes outside of food, but very much the food system, but very much integrated uh, and, and critical for the food system. So if we want food systems to function effectively, we want businesses who are working on nutrition and food to function effectively, we need a political environment that embraces global cooperation and inclusion, supports private sector engagement, and minimizes political polarization and geopolitical competition. We are in an incredible moment of time of this massive fracturing of our political processes. And I know it goes outside this report, but it's so central to everything we do now. And everyone who doesn't think about politics needs to be thinking about it. And I think many of you saw that the United States has officially pulled out of the WHO um, uh, in funding the WHO and the support for the WHO, which is catastrophic in, in my opinion, and makes all of this much more difficult. Um, you know, the U.S. has decided to basically check out of global cooperation, which is an unfortunate situation. Um, so I just, I want to put that on the table and I hope Q&A comes up. It, there's, I was looking at the attendees. There's lots of people from private sector. It'd be great to touch a bit on this COVID world order that we're in now um, to, and, and hear about some of the additional challenges layered on top of these economic challenges that the double burden brings to businesses. And I'll stop there, Tim. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Jess. Very thought provoking as usual. Um, the questions are starting to come in in the Q&A. Please keep typing your questions. Um, uh, I'll kick off with one or two uh, directly to the panelists and uh, then switch to the ones in the chat, uh, in the Q&A. Um, so can I start off asking Ken, uh, what are some of the challenges that you've found in raising the profile of the nutritional challenges within your workforce and, and in addressing it, I guess? And to answer Scott's point earlier, um, have you seen notable returns on investment in terms of stimulating better nutrition within the workforce and has that led to productivity gains? Okay, thanks again, Tim. Um, Within Ghana, there is some clear evidence that there are some dietary shifts. Um, people look out more and more for, you know, processed foods, you know, fast foods, um, because of, you know, lack of time as we, we progress within, within the system. And so um, generally the focus for people has been for fast foods and, you know, processed foods. And we all know about the impact that this, you know, would have on um, the people, which would eventually translate to uh, productivity on the business. So um, there are clearly, you know, a couple of impacts that have resulted from this. One of them, which is key, has to do with malnutrition. We also can talk about obesity. And um, we, 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 by and large, see, you know, the kind of impact that it has on business. And uh, this is, you know, very wide and varied. We can talk about um, absenteeism, you know, through uh, medical reasons. We can also be talking about um, low productivity and, um, you know, other things that are related to it. So um, those are the key things. What, what I see from um, the perspective that we are within Ghana 
is that sometime back last year, we, we embarked on uh, what we call uh, 30 days of wellness, where we try to help colleagues to be able to improve on their diet. Um, this was actually broken into three parts. The first part was where we were looking at the engagement perspective. And from the engagement perspective, what we were looking at doing was to get colleagues to be connected at work and then to um, have health professionals talking to our colleagues on what kind of diets to take uh, to boost their immune system and then to also keep them healthy. The second bit that we were also looking at was to have some kind of a contest where colleagues would participate in. Um, this contest was specifically aimed at improving the BMI. And so we had a number of colleagues who, you know, subjected themselves for that kind of contest. And um, we tracked this on a regular basis. And I'm happy to say that that really yielded some positive results. The third one was where we crowned it all with some kind of fun games, where we had some uh, hectic activity, you know, soccer um, gala, where we had soccer among employees. And all these were aimed at, first of all, like I said, having colleagues engaged at work, keeping them connected, and then also to improve on their health and then let them know who is who and, you know, get them to also focus on the health needs that they are. In terms of the benefits to the business, I would say that it's also wide and varied. So key things that we experienced, number one is that we experienced a reduction in our medical bills, which I would say is a very positive one. And uh, you know that when you have positive, positively engaged colleagues at the workplace, it also translates onto productivity. So productivity went high among colleagues. And um, you can also talk about you know, the excitement that it brought to the workplace where people look forward to come to work rather than screen out of bed to come to work. And so that, that for me has been the big one. Um, we didn't just end there. We also looked at our farmers because, and the community at large because at the end of the day, um, whatever products that we come out with are for the consumption of the public. And so if we have a healthy workforce and if we have a healthy community, that also improves our well-being. So we had a lot of focus also on the community where uh, we engaged them in um, um, some health talks. We had some screening for them, you know, and all these were done together with um, um, health professionals who came up with the structure, the plan, the process, the approach, and that also really helped the community. Then the third bit that we looked at was for the farming population. Um, for our farmers and, uh, and, and, and suppliers, we, we ran a variety of um, initiatives through what we call the Olam Healthy Living Campaign. Um, that, that also encompasses you know, educating the farmers on you know, the correct dietary habits, also to um, help them with some sustainability initiatives in terms of access to good quality and affordable water, and then um, a wide range of other education sessions, which were done also in partnership with our uh, expert organizations on uh, healthy living. And so um, I will say that the impact on the business has been very positive to say the least. And um, it's, it's something that we continue to focus on. Even though what I'm talking about was for last year, it's something that you know, is going to run within this year. This year it becomes more critical even with the, with, with the onset of COVID because um, what we will be aiming at doing will be to help our colleagues, the community and our farmers to improve on their immune system. And that is also going to be improved through healthy diets, you know, and then healthy choices that you will have to make um, to, to be able to, to arrive at that, inclusive of, you know, um, some exercises that they need to, you know, do. Um, the last one that I want to mention was, is the fact that with the onset of COVID, we, we were looking at some kind of virtual programs that would also help employees, our farmers, our suppliers to be connected. And so the big one that we, we were looking at is to have some kind of virtual programs. The virtual program that we have now is where um, we have um, colleagues who would log into a particular platform and then join in some aerobic sessions at some specific times within the day. That also comes with its own attendance um, uh, competition as well. So people will have to you know, record videos of themselves engaging in a particular exercise that you know, would, would receive some recognition from um, among the workforce. 
so far it's been great and I look forward to having that happening again. Thank you very much Ken. Uh, Scott, as a medical um, uh, professional yourself, mm -hmm. can I ask a kind of two-part question? Sure. One is that clearly there are a whole range of, uh, as you said, things that, that businesses could spend their money on. Um, one of the things that came out of our discussions was that often uh, environmental sustainability, social mobility, etc., were a greater concern from mm -hmm. a CSR perspective than, than nutrition mm -hmm. and, uh, and well-being. So how do you raise nutrition up the, uh, up the workforce, uh, um, uh, up the priority within the company um, for workforces and community is the first question. And then the second question touches on um, the issue of uh, effectively workforce confidentiality and how do you, as a professional, think about monitoring the health of the workforce and what sorts of things can you do to spot where particular interventions need to be done or is it a situation where within a company uh, you have to do it at a company level and a, you know a, like a public health thing rather than kind of a nutrition monitoring within uh, the workforce for people at, at, at risk? Got it, got it. No, it's a good question and, and um, uh, let me tackle that second part first if you don't mind. Um, and and I, I would say that it is it is not easy. Um, and and, and um, in my head, I'm flashing in my I'm going through a bunch of our different locations on all the different challenges that that we face in, in, in different areas. And I, I can tell you this that um, they need to have um, for the workforce to be able to to comply with your programs and uh, or or at least um, do what they need to do as far as, as maintaining and, and supporting their own health. They need to trust that you're. Um, that you're there to, to support them and to help them and you're not there to just pick, well, you're healthy, you're not healthy, you're not going to get the next promotion. I mean, if they, if they even have a sense that, you're, that that's even possible, um, you, you're going to lose them altogether. And so, so in different locations, um, we do different things. And so in our, in our businesses in Angola and Nigeria, as an example, we we are the health we are the health provider we 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 um we, we in nigeria have three of our own hospitals we have we have uh, again uh, we have very very large teams and so so we we are their medical support we are their medical team and um and there's great evidence that in our locations that um they'll get better medical care with us than they would be and they'll live longer with us if than, than if they weren't our employee and so 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 what happens is they go to their own medical providers and and their own medical providers are trained in health and wellness and making sure that that they're they're eating properly and they're and they're i mean all of the sort of let's just call it western standards as far as health are being met there and and so we are rolling these things out we advise but in other locations we do things differently and at other locations we may take the workforce and, and we don't necessarily bring them into our own data and we don't we don't necessarily measure them ourselves but we will we will pay for them to go see uh providers in the community maybe their own providers maybe someone else but but sort of wellness visits are encouraged and and um in, in some locations they you know the the uh, and most of them, to be honest with you, the employees will come back to the medical team and say, hey, this is the report I have. These are my labs. What do you think of this? This is what they told me. And so, so I think it's, it's mostly trying to find ways to work with them in, in a way that they, they trust you and you're not there to, to simply um, determine who's, to, who's next in line for a promotion or who, who's going to be, um, let's just say, branded as, as someone that's sick or, or problematic. But I mean, I think that, you know, um, Nutrition is, is one piece, but we see much there's a stigma attached with with um, with uh, psychiatric related issues, with with HIV and hepatitis. Um, you know, there, there's a variety of different things that create stigma. But if you can't not not just convince them, but if you can't put together a product where where their confidentiality is maintained, uh, you're not going to get the results that you need. You're not going to get the people to talk about those 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 underlying issues that are, that are, that are significant and contribute uh, to, to the overall problem. And, and you know what, if, if I'm going to have a, if we're going to put together a program where it's a checkbox exercise, where you evaluated um, once a year and, and with no results and, and with no real impact and no, you know, if, if it's not going to change my mind, if I went through one of these programs and it wasn't going to change my behavior at all, you know, I, I kind of question what's the value except saying we do it. And so, so, so taking a look at these, 
um, is very helpful. And, and then we do other things as well. That's just that's just one piece. But we have plenty of other activities, and and, and uh, whether it's 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 charity uh, raising money for charity, whether it's a a right now it's a global AIDS uh, meeting in San Francisco, and and we're putting together uh, there are virtual uh, virtual HIV walks and things like that, which is which is which is um, such an interesting time. Um, but we, we are we are putting we, um, but it, you don't have one day a year where it's health. We have um, every day of the year where there's health related focus and maybe the theme where the flavor changes on a monthly basis. But but um, but the overall theme is that it's sort of constant and and um, and, and it is a, a way of getting them to maintain and changing that culture. Um, you know, I think that it's it's much harder to 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 uh, how can I say avoid activity or avoid making changes when everybody in your office is is, is either counting steps or 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 performing some kind of virtual challenges or or you know I think so so anyway so so I think it's it's not it's not a one time issue it's it's a it's a cultural change and it works best when the leaders. Are, are, are engaged and when we see you know if I can tell you this that if we in, in the locations where we see the leader who's who's uh, who's uh, avid in, the, in, the, in the, either the fitness centers or or big into these um, how can I say these in, uh, these these charitable endeavors or the or the, the AIDS walks and things like that that the, the employees follow they, they, they follow they, they 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 look at the, the leader as a role model and a mentor and they they are they want to get closer and so so the, the culture does change and so there are ways of doing it but every location is different every I mean everything's going to be culturally sensitive otherwise it doesn't doesn't work but but I would say that there's a, there's a lot but but yeah, privacy is paramount if you want people to give you their um, to, 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 to address their issues. The other side of it is, is, um, is, is uh, pushing it in the workforce. And, and when I say pushing it, it's, it's not pushing. Everybody wants our people to be more productive, but, but, but what's, the, what's the driver of, uh, of, of any further investments? And uh, so we take a look at, um, again, the cost for healthcare are, are, um, is something that we, we, we do look at per member per month costs. And I know maybe in the UK, uh, it's not something that's as, as visible, but it is. You know, but it is very clear that there's cost, regardless of whether it's from the NHS or, um, you know, somebody pays for it. And, and so, so I think taking a look at, at outcomes and uh, and as was mentioned earlier, absenteeism. Um, we we see we see lots lots of uh, productivity related issues, and, um, and and I think the question is how do you keep people. Um, healthy, safe, and productive. And, um, you know, I think that in, in a lot of our locations, maybe remote offshore platforms and really remote locations where we need to fly our people in for, for a month and then get them out every month, um, if we have a more control. But, but the truth is this, is that if I, if I have a single individual who, who's a strong performer and his family is at home starving, um, they're going to have the same sort of, let's call it, uh, risks and problems that the community has. And so, so how do you have a productive worker when the when the family's starving, when the when when the wife when the, when the when the when the husband or wife is sick, when the children are sick, when you know? So I think it's I, I it's not just it's not just the employee we need to worry about. It's it's the whole family. It's it's it is the community, um, and uh, you know I think it's just just trying to. Um, how can I say it, it, it's uh, identifying where uh, I'll, I'll give you a great example of, of something that we, we were able to do. Um, and uh, we have a program in Angola called uh, it's the Melda Maculata Center. And I'm, I can't, I'm not going to have to spell it, but, um, but it's an HIV program and it's, uh, and it's set up to prevent mother to child transmission of HIV. And what we do is, and we talk about nutrition, we talk about, well, people are hungry, um, you know, certain things like, like breastfeeding is, is sort of a, a core component of how they're going to feed their children. Obviously, it's the cheapest, it, it's the cheapest, and, and in most, in, for, for most of the population, it's the best way to feed the child. Um, the challenge is, is that when you're HIV positive, it's not. Um, and, and so how do you tell someone who's starving and doesn't have food to not breastfeed their children? And so, so we, we put together a program where, um, where we give free food. Um, again, it's a, it, we, give, we give free food in exchange for a few things. Uh, one is that they come in to get their food, they get evaluated by medical providers, uh, they get counseled, they get their HIV medications, 
um, and uh, and then they also get trained to do something. And uh, it could be it could be I mean uh, how to sew. It could be some some basic arts and crafts. It could be basic things to be able to sell and make some money. And and, and in one year period, uh, we had 150. Uh, HIV positive women, pregnant HIV positive w women enter, um, and we had 150 negative uh, HIV negative babies as a result. Um, you know, so so it, it, it's 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 um, and the cost. I think the cost was roughly seventeen thousand dollars. So so you know, you talk about a very very small investment to save the lives or or to change, uh, you know, potentially change the the lives of 150 uh, children is significant and. Um, I don't think anyone would, would deny the hundred or hundred fifty dollars per per per, uh, per HIV negative baby would be a bad investment, but but it's all related to the underlying piece of nutrition and being able to get the food, and, and that's what brings them in. Sorry. Great, thanks very much. Um, can I move on to Jess? Sure. So, so Jess, from a from a uh, nutritionist perspective, if we are to move towards business helping in the sorts of way that Scott and Ken have been talking about uh, within the community. Um, what, the, uh, and there's some questions in, in the Q&A that kind of touch on this. What is the best way to improve community level of nutrition? Is it through provision of a uh, diverse culturally appropriate diet and access to that? Or is it through some of the things that um, uh, colleagues often tout as a as a silver bullet in terms of biofortification. Where is the balance in terms of uh, what uh, would be the best uh, way of intervening? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I think um, you know I obviously work more in the food system space, as you know, Tim. So so we we really work on how do you improve uh, diets overall and the quality and variety of diets and the entire food supply chain playing a role in that. But, um, you know, in the, in the nutrition world, certain interventions have been demonized, um, you know, kind of the pills, powders, pastes versus dietary diversity and food system approaches. And I think we need all of it depending on the context, right? In fragile situations, you can't be talking about a diverse food basket um, if, if you're at, in a major civil war. So, um, I think just you know, having one kind of siloed approach isn't going to work. And that's what makes nutrition more complicated from a political perspective, from, um, from, a, uh, from an, an implementation perspective, and then an impact perspective, because you need multiple approaches, not just within the food system, but you need good sanitation and hygiene, like what Ken was talking about. Um, you need, uh, you know, certain behavioral uh, incentives for certain behaviors, like exclusive breastfeeding is incredibly important early in life. And one of the comments was around investing in, in uh, more short-term uh, issues from Simon, which I really liked that question about, you know, he said a focus on child malnutrition can, could be presented as irrelevant when you're working in short time horizons. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that if you mitigate short uh, undernutrition early in life, you could have significant potential impacts on um, uh, impacting obesity and non-communicable disease in adult life. So you have a, this double duty, as, as WHO and Corinna Hawks have written about, where if you address that, what is considered unseen, that undernutrition situation, you could potentially have a double duty effect of, of impacting obesity as well. But you know, all of this, there's lots of interventions out there, Tim. And I think um, what, what is presented as a business case is that which has very strong evidence. It's very hard to convince governments and, and private sector if there's a lack of evidence of the impact on a certain community. So I think, um, and, and we in the nutrition community have been building that evidence base for a variety of different tools in the toolbox, be it biofortification, be it uh, more diverse production systems that are, are, are providing a variety of foods that a person can consume, food prices, uh, uh, healthier food environments, 
uh, banning advertising of junk food to children, better infant and young child feeding practices. So there's a whole range of different interventions and the evidence for those. And, and we need all of it. And that's why people just sort of check out when you start to talk about nutrition. Because, <laughs> because it's not like soap and clean water. <laughs> Right? Or quartum, a pill that you can take to to treat malaria. It's just not so easy. And so it, it, it makes it very complex. And I think there's a lot of comments around these vested interests, right? They're in the nutrition space in particular, it's a very particular thing. You can argue about it that it's an issue in global health with pharmaceuticals, but not nearly as contentious as, as it is in nutrition of this relationship of private sector and the power that they hold in the food system and the potential implications on malnutrition burden and the role of government. And if we don't have strong accountability mechanisms that foster government leadership and stewardship that incentivize private sector to include nutrition among their goals and reinforce strong engagement with civil society in creating demand for healthy food environments and, and monitoring prog progress towards nutrition agenda objectives, it becomes very hard. Those accountability mechanisms need to be transparent, they need to be open, they need to be inclusive, but we still need governments to exert their power and shepherd their food system in the direction to promote public health. They have to create dietary guidelines, public procurement programs, fiscal instruments, regulate industry when they are advertising junk food to children to keep private sector in check. Um, and, and that's critically important. And governments just are not doing that sufficiently. Yeah. Yeah. And so then it becomes incredibly hard to monitor behavior of actors across the food system. So, I know I'm kind of dancing around your question, but, <laughs> but it's just well, not no, no. so simple to say, you know, we need these three things, you know, private sector can do it all. Cause it's just, we've learned time and time again, that's it. That approach is just not true. Yeah. You know, there's no silver bullets, unfortunately. Great. Thanks very much, Jess. Um, that brings on neatly onto a question. Um, donor aid plays a massive role in funding for nutrition with both domestic and donor finances coming under strain due to COVID and this report unlocking the true cost of malnutrition to businesses if they fail to act, how do people on the panel see the private sector supporting nutrition interventions at scale? So where is the particular role of the private sector in, as Jess said, you can't do it by yourself. You need to work with communities, you need to work with donors, you need to work with uh, um, uh, the wider development community and perhaps most of all you need to work with government. So, so in that space, where are the key things that you can do to unlock and drive interventions at scale? Who wants to go first? Laura, Caroline, feel free to chip in as well if you want to. So, so I'll, I'll go first. And, and, Thanks Scott. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm laughing because it's not an easy, it's not an easy answer. Um, <laughs> you know, and, it's um, so. So I think that's the biggest challenge right now in, in this field is um, is because we have this overwhelming crisis um, that that's, that's literally globally uh, a global crisis where everybody is shut down, productivity is significantly lower, economies are down. So so you, I mean it's not. I mean it ends up to be uh, just think of what the problems are. A there's less money. Uh, B, we're looking at, I mean, if they haven't been laid off, people are looking at layoffs, so, you know, around the world if this thing, if we can't get a handle on, on, the, on the outbreak. And so, so it becomes a significant issue. And then, um, and then, you know, obviously if you're trying to function and you're not thinking of, of COVID related relief or support, um, you, you obviously it seems like as a, as a company, you're, you're, I mean, it seems hard to not uh, focus on, on the, on the, damage related to the COVID problems, whether it's logistics, whether it's supply, refilling supply chain, as I mentioned, uh, procurement related issues. And so, so I think it, and I think it is a significant problem. I, I, you know, the question is, is that how, um, you know, how, how do we uh, in the short term, not let people lose focus on the, on the, on the great work and great projects that they've done before. Um, yeah. And it's, 
and I, I would say that it is it is very much about, uh, and I don't mean to keep going back to data and things like that, but it's very much so. What's our opportunity? How could we contribute in a way that's meaningful? Um, and 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 I think that you know, there's nothing wrong with you know, in, in the short term, connecting it with the, with the sort of the COVID COVID related damage that's being done. Um, as far as the need, because it is, um, you know, we, we are looking at, we look at things as, as uh, A, we look at food and food banks, we also look at PPA, PPE and helping hospitals and providers and, and, and there's plenty of things we do, but I think it's, I think it's, there's plenty of people that, that are, um, are clearly, uh, uh, you know, struggling with food. And if they were struggling before, they're definitely struggling a lot more now. So, I mean, so again, I, I, not, not, and again, maybe I'm dancing more than just did on, on that one, but, um, but it's, it is, it's not an easy answer right now. It's, 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 it's a huge challenge. The, uh, another question from down the list, which I, I think I will um, pass to Ken. Um, should businesses support the, and promote the right to food? Um, business support matched by a commitment to ensure pay rights support their employees being able to afford nutritious foods would be a major step forwards towards eliminating undernutrition. So how does the relationship between your con paying conditions for the workforce and uh, feeding into family household income, how does that fit in your thinking about nutrition being a company that does think about nutrition, uh, Olam, Ken? Uh, how does that fit in, in terms of uh, the, the balance between interventions that might work at scale? All right, Tim, I think that is, that is a very fair question, but um, I'd rather want to look at it from some other perspective. So um, what I know is that as long as people's um, earnings change, their taste and preferences also change. And so um, it's not going to be, uh, I don't think that linking salary to uh, nutrition would be the right thing to do. What I think that we need to be doing will be to look at um, cultural changes as well as perhaps mindset changes. So if the people understand what is good for them, then they would also be in a position to change. And that's why I am a strong proponent of um, having some kind of education for people to understand what you know, the right choices are for them with respect to um, improving their health conditions and improving their, you know, diet is, is, is critical. As long as that is done, there will be that, that connection. Because if that connection is not there, then, you know, improving on the weight bill doesn't really help. And uh, even though I've been in HR for quite a time, I wouldn't be somebody that would support, you know, the need to increase salary just so people can. I mean, increasing salary is good but I'll not want to link it to you know, improving you know, the health and nutrition bit. Um, what, I, what I would also want to say is that um, uh, if, if we look at um, the role of the private sector uh, in this kind of challenge, um, I'll say that even though COVID has brought some kind of a pressure on businesses, which has translated to individuals, I think that it's going to be something that will be passing. And so it's important that we try to, you know, hold um, um, the people together. And as long as that is there, we also need to be working on that, you know, mindset change, mindset shift. And so um, my view would be to, you know, reinforce the education bit, reinforce, you know, the proper concepts that have to do with nutrition among the workforce. And once the workforce are properly aligned with respect to what is good, they will then impact the families also, and that will also have you know, a rippling effect on the other people within the communities. And those are areas where um, I believe that we need to focus on. If we focus on that and we reinforce that concept, then we would look at you know, perhaps reasons why salaries will have to be adjusted, which, like I said, should not be linked to nutrition at all. Uh, fully agree, but, but I do think there is, there is a, a uh, a bottom line constraint is that to, to support economic access to food, wages have to be fair. And I'm not saying anything about Olam, but you know, certainly there are some <laughs> companies yeah, who were shockingly bad at paying living wages and al allowing people to have that economic access. Um, an interesting question's come in, which, which strikes uh, one of the things that um, I was surprised by within the research that we conducted. Um, and that is the, the fact that so many companies 
uh, did bits and pieces of nutrition related stuff when it came to um, uh, company reports and CSR type programs, but didn't own the issue of nutrition within the company because they didn't necessarily see it as a, a, a problem for them to deal with. Um, and the question is, why is awareness so low among businesses when broader awareness of the double burden of malnutrition is so widely discussed now? So I think there is that, that kind of broad question that for many businesses and many institutions, it's seen as a somebody else's problem, it's not our problem. And yet it's all pervasive, the fact that malnourishment is a global issue and it has been highlighted particularly within in COVID. So anybody want to kind of chip in on, on that? Jess, I can see you waving. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to hear from Scott and Ken who work, you know, of course, centrally in, in private sector, but it, you know, to me, the complexity of the report is that, and I was thinking about this, you know, last night as I was reading it again, um, it's not like, so that you're, you're, you're costing out the, the burden of malnutrition in the workforce and how costly that is for a private sector. And, and you could argue, let's say you have workers and they're exposed to some sort of toxin because they're working on machinery that's spitting out that toxin. And you can then fix that machinery, right? But their workforce, they're there for the day and then they leave that workforce and they interact with the, the greater world, right? And food is everywhere. It's not this one machine that you can fix that's spitting out a toxin, right? It's food is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's part of our, our social fabric. And, and so to me, it becomes really complex of, and, and I would love to hear from Scott and Ken, Ken about this because to me, it's, I think there's a bit of, well, we can do only so much. As a, as a private sector entity. We can't control what people do when they leave the office. You know, they go into the world, they make certain decisions about what they buy. They, they live a certain lifestyle. There's only so much we can do. We can only have a bit in our, in our corporate social responsibility packages, et cetera. So I, I would love to hear a bit more about that because that's, the challenge of nutrition is that, and, and, and the food space is that it's everywhere and it's everyone's responsibility. And the minute you have that everyone's responsibility, again, it's a bit of, well, all right, government needs to do that. We don't need to do that. Or private sector needs to behave. Governments don't need to do anything. So, it's one of those things, and I know there's lots of experts in the, in the audience too, but this is where I find it hard to create, quote, the business case for nutrition when it's everywhere. Um, so I'd love to hear from others on this, but yeah. It, it, Thank, anyway. Thanks, Jess. Before going to Ken and Scott, Laura, you wanted to just throw something in there. Sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I was just going to offer a bit more kind of um, context in terms of what the companies responded with when we approached them to take part in this research and to talk to us about about this and I think it was very revealing I mean the vast vast majority said no sorry can't talk to you but but the reasons were kind of indicative I think of a hesitancy to stick their neck out on this um, partly because it's such a complex issue and partly because it's not at all clear or didn't seem at all clear to the company to be approached where it sits, whose responsibility it is. So that point about it's everyone's responsibility seemed to play out within the company too. So it was passed between the sustainability leads and the HR leads and HR are saying, well, yeah, we, nutrition, that's not, malnutrition is a society problem. That's not really something to talk about. And sustainability leads say, well, we're not health experts. We're not nutrition experts we haven't got that visibility over our workforce um, and and so it really did seem like there was you know there are lots of responses that said this is interesting this is valuable we're glad you're doing this research but we're not well placed to talk to you right now um, and I think that's really key but another thing I think 
that came out is that, um, so I, I mentioned the assumption that under nutrition is directly correlated with wages and incomes. So lots of companies said, you know, our employees are well paid relative to the context in which they're working, relative to the wider population, they won't be affected by malnutrition. Um, so they're understanding malnutrition as undernutrition and linking undernutrition to the lowest paid groups of society. They recognized obesity as being prevalent amongst the workforce, but talked about it as a lifestyle condition, not something, you know, not in the same way as a health condition, despite the fact that the health conditions that were mentioned the most, you know, musculoskeletal problems, cardiovascular, diabetes, mental health, all have strong links with malnutrition. So I do think there's some kind of awareness raising to do amongst companies, but more broadly, I think Jess's point is absolutely right that, you know, it's a, it's a large problem, it's multifactorial, we're all saying how complex it is and how difficult it is to give one single answer. And that's why I think things like um, Olam's at source platform that you know, brings an element of accountability for the wider impact and the wider reach that a company can have, not only you know, direct actions in the workplace, but how is a company looking to address the societal problems faced by their stakeholders and the communities on which they depend, looking for that kind of accountability and encouraging companies to really broaden their scope and their remit and their area of responsibility, I think will be absolutely key to, to heightening the relevance of this. Thanks very much, Laura. Scott, Ken, do you want to rise to Jess's challenge? Scott first. Sure, sure, happy to. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you this, that um, um, uh, certain things that might be common sense on, you know, in a, in a panel like this or, or in a group like, uh, you know, that, that participates in a call like this, but I, but I can tell you that the, um, that the uh, the difference between uh, malnutrition or the or sort of the double burden um, is it, I, it, it isn't as well known or is it as, as uh, you know amongst let's just call them normal people and I mean normal people is is we have you know if you called my house and, you know during the day and my son answered the phone and said I want to talk to you about uh, about uh, about this he would have no idea who who is the right person to talk to whether this is the wrong number whether who, you know what's going on and, and I would say that in a company without a, a like, you know a dedicated a health team that you can speak with and try to understand um, sort of what the, you know what's going on in the company where is their social investment money going where are their programs dedicated to it's hard to it's hard to get a sense of, of what's going on but I would say that um, you know th this piece of, of, of what companies should do has a lot to do with with who's who's counseling them who's consulting to them and what they see uh, and, and if they say that they they have a job opening and a thousand people apply for the job and and and, and there are plenty of fit uh, people who who are who are you know maybe well you know again they're, they're well educated and well fed and, I mean it's not something they physically see and so so it ends up to be you know looking outside their outside their um, their own shop and and and, and sort of um, getting some info but it's it's not it's not clear to to most people on. Um, on that on that distinction and and it should be it absolutely should be that the childhood stunting and things like that are, are clear clear metrics and goals for that, that that could be evaluated and reviewed and, and you can get a real good ROI on that, on those things and so but I, but I would say that um, it, it's it's not so widely accepted and known amongst amongst corporations that these are the specific metrics and and and, and, and milestones that we need to achieve or we need to be striving to, to, to address um, and absolutely should be, but it's, it's not. And I, and I think that that's, that's what part of the challenge of addressing it is, is, is getting this into, into, into uh, getting this knowledge across to, into, into the wider community. And, and, and um, but, but I, and, and anyway, that's part of the reason why yeah. you're helping to support. Thanks Scott. Ken, anything brief to add? Yeah, sure. So um, I think that some valid comments were made by Laura, which I would want to you know, add a bit to. Um, I think largely um, from the private sector, there's a lot of um, focus on the quality of hire that we have in terms of how well educated they are and so how well they should be able to make choices for themselves. And so that, that is one bit that really relegates you know, the subject of nutrition to the background. So that is one bit. Then the other bit also has to do with the fact that um, if you look at most private organizations, the key focus is to make money. 
And so as long as the subject has to do with how much money you can make, you know, you'll have to you know, have that conversation. Hardly will people kind of link the issues in the food system with the uh, nutrition. And um, I, I, I would want to come back to my initial point, the fact that those are issues that need to be discussed irrespective of the caliber of people that we have, because that would have an impact of you know, um, affecting other people outside the world of work. Thank you very much. Um, we are rapidly running out of time, and although we could go on for a, a very long period of time, I, I would like to ask um, a question with respect to uh, the broadly the investment agenda, timeframes, and uh, SDGs, ESG agenda, and so on. So, one part of the question is. How does the panel see the nutrition agenda tr translating through the ESG agenda, particularly from the perspective of an, of an analyst or an investor? Um, that's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is one we touched on earlier. Um, if you're intervening particularly in childhood malnutrition, then you could argue that that's irrelevant to everyday business activity because the time scale is so long. Um, so how can you make that broader community level childhood investment, child focused nutrition investment, how can you make this agenda relevant and reportable for long term investment into perpetuity? So two questions around that investment. How can you uh, really kind of uh, uh, for a company coming in, uh, for an investor coming in, looking to, to uh, have a long-term investment in your company, where is the benefit of intervening in, in childhood mal malnutrition? And then how does an investor see the, your work within ESG incorporate, incorporating nutrition and how visible does that become and how much does that contribute towards achieving a wider SDG type agenda? So, um... I think that in the first place, uh, one of the key things that we should be looking at will be uh, trying to draw a connection between a healthy workforce and then um, productivity. Because as long as the workforce is healthy, as long as the workforce is healthy, there's going to be you know, a positive translation on productivity. And so for the investor who is coming in, there should be that kind of understanding that there is some kind of return on investment when it comes to you know, that aspect. Um, if we have to look at it from the perspective of the community, I mean, we as a business cannot thrive on our own as an island. We will definitely need the community. And so um, if we are going to hire people from the community, then we need to ensure that that also affects the community positively. So that's number one, you know, positively affecting the community. And um, we also would be looking at, you know, a sustainable business. So if we want to look at the sustainability of the business, then how can we help the community to be able to have, you know, lives that are worth it? And this um, is, is closely linked to, you know, the um, purpose of Ulam as, as we exist. And so um, I'll look at it from these perspectives. The fact that, number one, we will need to draw a link between productivity and the healthy workforce, which will ultimately impact the community. And then the fact that in trying to draw that link, we would also need to be able to you know, have the understanding that we don't exist as an island, but you know, we have to relate with our suppliers, our farmers who will be within the community. And then at the end of the day, that would you know, project the business positive. And so there's some huge ROI that we can benefit if we focus on nutrition. Thank you. Scott, quick comment? Sure, I'll try to make this quick. Um, so I'll tell you this, as, a, as a, both a, a doctor, a physician, and a, and a father, I can tell you that there's no amount of money I would ever tell you it would be a waste of money to, the way a waste to, as far as serving children um, and, 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 and correcting things that, that should never have happened in the first place or, 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 or addressing the, you know, sort of their issues. But, but I would say, um, you know, a, 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 it's just because that child isn't necessarily going to be one of your workers in the next five years doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to make a major impact on the, on the, on the, on the community, on the medical resources, on the, on the family situation. Um, you know, I, I can tell you on a, probably on, a hand, on one hand, how many days of work I've missed in the last 10 years. And, and, and every one of those days have been related to the cost of an issue with a child or, 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 or something similar. So I, I would say that, 
um, it, it's just a marker of something else. If you think that, that, that helping children isn't going to necessarily translate to to a more productive community and and and, and workforce, you're, you're, you know, I, I would say that there. I, I mean, that's an opinion that I don't share, but but I think that it's. Um, yeah, I mean, one sick child can cost in, 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 a, in a place like the U.S. can cost a million dollars or more just dealing with a, with, with a single hospitalization or complication. Um, and, and so I think that it's uh, in our remote operations, a sick child will shut down our medical team, will eat up our resources. I mean, so, so there's so many factors of why, why, why it's not a waste. Um, and, and why it's much easier to deal with a child as well as far as compliance and making sure they get what they need. And so, so there's not a lot of the extraneous factors, but I, you know, I mentioned earlier about saving 100, 150 HIV negative children. Uh, I mean, that's a perfect example. Like those are, those are, if I want to, if I want to, if I want to work or if I want a business in a, in a location for, for, for decades, I, those, those, you know, five years would be a two, would, 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 wouldn't be worth we need to look at the long term and what the community is like. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Jess, we're running out of time. Final words from you about uh, this, the, 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 this space perhaps, but perhaps from a community perspective. Um, it strikes me a lot of the things that you said earlier are about how everything fits together and it is everybody's responsibility but it's also about ensuring good sanitary hygiene access to water access to money proper policy uh, education literacy all of these things fit together and not one single thing will be the silver bullet sorry i'm leaving the witness my lord <laughs> no it's good i mean i think i think that's exactly true and i think you know if we're talking about investors and why should they care I do think it is on all of us who work in, in the nutrition space to better educate those investors on why it's such a critical investment. I think it's not clear that undernutrition is an underlying cause of many diseases. I and mean, we're seeing the obesity being a significant comorbidity with COVID. You know, COVID outcomes are much worse when you're obese. So I think, um, we need to better educate those who want to invest in business and want to invest in nutrition on why it's such a critical issue. It's not a visceral issue like Ebola infection or dengue or something like that that's very infectious and rapidly spreading and is, is very visually uh, uh, alarming. Um, but, and I, I think there's also this idea that you'll often hear, well, obesity is someone's willpower. It doesn't, it, that, that, that's up to them to change. We know that's not true. We know food environments are very perverse. It's very hard to eat healthy. It's very costly to eat healthy. And the, co the societal and economic costs of obesity around the world for every country is, to me, an incredible source of investment. But we just, I, I do put it a, a bit of the blame on the nutrition community in the nutrition world that we haven't communicated that effectively, that case for investment. So I, I do put it, the responsibility on us. We all talk to each other. Are we talking to investors who don't know where to place their money? They want to do something for societal good. Are they thinking about nutrition? Are they thinking about climate change? Why not both, right? This double investment. So, um, yeah, we need to get we need to get our house in order to to better communicate that to those who are willing to invest money. Great. Well, thanks very much to everybody. We're out of time. I'm really sorry we haven't managed to get through all of the very rich questions that uh, have been asked today. Um, please feel free, anybody, to get in contact with the Chatham House team to follow up if there are questions. Um, Enormous thanks to Jess, Ken, and Scott for uh, uh, coming today and uh, talking uh, on the panel. Um, obviously, enormous thanks to Laura and Caroline for presenting as well. Um, and I know Laura and the team have sweated blood uh, throughout the, 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 the course of this research uh, to get a really good product um, out at the end of the day. Um, I think we have not answered a whole lot of questions with the research, but we have posed a lot of questions um, and absolutely, uh, uh, hopefully it will have been a stimulating um, 
set of thoughts and information for you from whatever constituency that you come from. Um, and final thanks to the behind the scenes team at Chatham House for doing the technical support, Robin and Charlotte and Richard and, uh, and co behind the scenes. Uh, it's been a great event and final thanks to Power of Nutrition for funding the, the, the work that has allowed us to do, do this research. And um, fly the flag people, as Jess says, this is uh, uh, something that really needs a wider discussion in society as a whole. Um, uh, particularly in the business investment community, but working with governments and civil society and funders and donors and, and so on. So stay safe, everybody. Good luck and thanks for your time. Um, I can't say safe journeys, but you know, keep your head down when COVID's around. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks all. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.